Hey everyone. Welcome to the <laughs> Welcome to the next session. Oh, are we on? <laughs> I think we are. We are live. Look at that. Um, welcome to the next session. We are uh, I'm Shanley. I am the technical sales manager from uh, BSG Canada uh, for Western Canada and this is Matt <laughs> from Gambrina Smalting. <laughs> I'm the commercial manager at Gambrina Smalting. Um, so we're, we're hosting this session um, and I'll give a little introduction about BSG Canada. As many of you know, we've been producing and distributing brewing products to Canadian markets since the 1990s with our warehouse locations in Delta, uh, Guelph, Ontario, Quebec, and now in Airdrie, uh, Alberta. So um, we're excited to be sponsoring this session. Uh, Matt, do you wanna give a quick intro about Gambrina? Yeah, so we're located up in Armstrong, British Columbia. We're uh, the smallest in industrial malt house in North America, and uh, we're, we focus on specialty malts and, and base malts as well. Awesome. Well, we are really happy to be uh, sponsoring this session together, um, and uh, we are bringing on Keith, who is going to be um, uh, doing this session, which we're really excited about. Let me bring up a little bit about Keith. He has quite an extensive background. Keith first tried home brewing during university and still brews at home with his wife. Keith has brewed from 40 hectoliters all the way up to 1,000 hectoliters from the North Atlantic to the South Pacific. He developed craft brews in Canada and New Zealand, as well as working with a plethora of global beers. Keith served the Master Brewers Association in Canada in roles up to president. Keith has represented the MBAA and presented at the MBAA and IBD conferences. Keith loves to challenge people to know better and respect more those two critical components, which are the foundations of our trade, barley and yeast. When it comes to beer, Keith loves pretty much, well, all beer styles. Keith particularly enjoys flavorful beers that show the brewers have fully appreciated their barley malts, and we appreciate that. So help me in welcoming Keith. There, uh, hopefully uh, things are working now. Um, hopefully it's uh, up and running now. Uh, that was a great previous, we can see you and hear you, that's good. Uh, it was a great previous talk on sensory and it's always uh, great to get some insights into sensory and uh, thanks very much to BSG and Gambrinas to uh, sponsor things today. Um, there will be uh, some question and answer after, and uh, if you can throw your questions uh, into chat, uh, there'll be a moderator to help uh, set this up afterwards. I'm going to uh, just dive right into this thing and uh, start sharing my screen, and hopefully uh, things will go well from there. Good day, everyone. This is certainly not the same as sharing a beer together, but it is great for the sharing of information to proceed. If you give me a couple moments, I think that I can quickly get around to explaining why I titled today's presentation Knowing the Name of Something. I believe that this quote illustrates an opportunity for all brewers of beers, a positive potential that we all need to promote. Our success depends upon perceptions. To invite people into beer, we brewers should be working hard and working consistently to make people comfortable with enjoying all aspects of beer. We need to be able to communicate clearly and with positivity. We need positive perceptions. Beer has always been supported by communication. Even the medieval broom symbol was an invitation to partake. Here's our problem today. Our modern guild is seeing our beers consumed less often our business model is under challenge. Well then, how can we explain this? Perhaps this is just people now drinking less beer, but drinking the so-called better beers. 
Sure, the recent and vast expansion of the number of breweries is also something that must support an increase in positive consumer perceptions with the word beer. Shouldn't all of this activity help sell more beer? Well, actually it seems that many consumers are more often choosing elsewhere. Despite the boom of craft beers, per capita consumption of beer has been declining for almost 50 years now. And perhaps this decline has even been accelerating in the most recent couple of years. Shocking. Wine, cider, and even spirits are eating our lunch. There's nothing short of a disaster for brewers, for brewery owners, for barley farmers, maltsters, hop farmers, and hop processors, and in my opinion, even for society as a whole. The very day that I was asked to take part in this conference, I happened upon an article by someone from BC, an Indigenous writer, and it was entitled The Plot to Hack Reality by Changing Language. She specifically bemoaned her lack of patience for any effort that makes language a less workable and functional tool. As a writer, she takes this assault upon the tool with which she conducts her craft very personally, stating that I can no longer go along with this assault on language. I myself have long bemoaned that we humans have struggled to communicate our thoughts clearly ever since we lived in caves and had very little besides sticks and big round stones for tools. Confusion, that challenge of communication, continues. The English language has evolved over time into a vast amalgam of language sources, readily mashing together words absorbed from any other languages, whether near or far. I could suggest that the vast majority of humor down through the ages has been our joy in playing with our words, making fun of the confusing inferences of words, and indeed, there's everything good about having fun. Humor is so often about playing with ambiguity, and make me one with everything. Humor plays with our perceptions, and that should help us to appreciate that what we see may not be what others are seeing. <clears throat> The English language has encouraged the many Shakespeare's of history to invent new words out of whole cloth, and then taken joy in adopting such precise new idioms. There is indeed a positive aspect about evolution in our language, and not just adopting new words from the Shakespeare's of the English language, but often accepting new words as they emerge from the tribal vernaculars of the smallest pockets of English speakers, combining fun with precise meanings, and there is everything good about having fun. So yes, Maggie Champion's lack of patience with efforts to make our language a less workable and functional tool struck a chord with me. Maybe not with everyone here, but certainly with my perception. <clears throat> her words took me to thoughts of the Nobel Prize winner Richard Feynman. Feynman was a teacher, mathematician, physicist, humorist, and musician, whose work on quantum physics led to a Nobel Prize. Feynman was a great communicator, since someone constantly read and viewed even today. Feynman famously sought to clarify that there is an important difference between knowing the name of something and actually understanding and appreciating that something. Perceptions are important. I would like to postulate that we brewers have a big opportunity, and that chance requires us all to get back to doing a better job of communicating beer positive uh, and consistent and clear language that invites people to enjoy every facet of beer, every perception from the field to the tongue. Famously, Feynman reluctantly took part in the commission charged with explore, uh, finding the cause of the disastrous re-entry explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger 35 years and 10 days ago. Feynman would not allow others to divert him from the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Reality before public relations. That is a great comment. <clears throat> and so I entitled today's discussion Knowing the Name of Something in Honor of Feynman and in the hope that we can work together to help more people to actually know more than just the name of our beverage, to help them to actually know and respect beer. So let's be honest too. Our modern guild is seeing our products consumed less often. Let's accept that this situation is nothing short of a disaster. Therefore, we need to take action. Consumers have lost touch with beer. Perceptions of beer have provided a bond down through untold millennia. These thousands of years of relationships have been squandered in the most recent decades, like Feynman's positive association between his learning to draw, leading him on to looking at art. We brewers must lead consumers back into looking at beer, admiring beer, appreciating beer. 
These Google word trends paint a horrifying loss of awareness. The use of words such as borrowing and malt just dropping away. A scary decline. People are simply losing their ancient connection with barley and with malt. They simply no longer know what these things actually are. And yet, we vitally continue to talk to our consumers as if they do know barley and malt. Sadly, they do not know. I will again cherry pick from Feynman. He denotes three things that are incredibly hard for humans. One, to not fool ourselves. Two, being smart does not mean you're right. Three, we are all prejudiced and might believe things that are just feelings and not actually facts. The word beer is indeed in wide use today, but consumers are just not aware of the ale and lager distinctions and not aware of barley and malt. So, I may be quite wrong with regard to everything I say to you today. These things may just be spurious correlations that are simply a sham. But I'll plunge forward by admitting the things I say are only hypotheses, and I'll ask for your help in testing them out in the real world with the perceptions of real people. My first hypothesis is that beer needs more people playing together more often. People participate in play mostly when they've learned to feel comfortable about what the playing is all about. Let's work to help people feel comfortable with playing together and participating with beer. I also hypothesize that the further we move from our connections between real people and barley, the greater the continuing decline in per capita beer consumption will be. Barley is the heart of beer, the major component in beers. People need to be able to feel comfortable and to have positive perceptions with barley so they can openly respect beer. Consumers are not knowing beer today. Perhaps losing touch with the field, losing their awareness of barley has allowed for the creation of this gap. I feel that surely the modern lack of awareness of barley has at the very least aggravated the size of the gap. Perceptions matter. So now there's this chasm. This lack of knowing something, creating this inability to clearly see the beer. We are so damn sure that consumers can see it because we can see it. But we are looking through our own lens, our own tunnel vision of brewing and of beer. And often, we ourselves do not actually know what barley is, do not appreciate barley ourselves. We need to admit some things to ourselves and acknowledging that a consumer need exists and it is up to us to help them see what we see. We want the world to know that all beers are made well, starting with pretty simple ingredients and that anyone can be proud to openly appreciate and enjoy beers. Barley is the world's oldest grain. Barley is the world's most globally grown grain. Humans and barley evolved alongside each other over millions of years. Barley has been the foundation of beers for many more millennia than we can commonly state. And beers have been the fuel for celebrations and camaraderie and invention and innovation down through the ages. Beer is something beautiful. Learning to appreciate beer is akin to learning to draw and finding yourself drawn into art. Each component of the living thing that beer is, each stage in the process of evolving barley seeds into plants and barley kernels into beer is simply fantastic and beautiful. We brewers need to paint this beautiful picture in unison. Beer illuminates science, chemistry, biology, geography, and allows them to emerge together like a butterfly's chrysalis opening up, beautiful beer emerging from the nodding heads of barley ripening out in the field. And finally, beer shining its bright light on art and culture and on play and fun. Let's be honest, beer is life and we need to share this positive perception. We brewers need to come together as a true guild. Together, we need to put forth a consistent and positive communication. We need to turn aside this process of loss and work with vigor to reconnect consumers with knowing the something that is brewing and barley and beer. We need to be talking consistently and promoting positive awareness of the ancient origins of barley and of brewing. Surely, this will help consumers' perceptions, help them to know beer, thus promoting a better enjoyment of playing together, enjoying beers together. Down through the ages, even the ultra-urban of those long-ago times all knew barley and malting and brewing and beer. 
Our ancestors were every bit as smart and probably even much more observant than people living today. <clears throat> but today's all uber urban living has truly separated people from actually knowing the something. People no longer know what beer is. That is my additional hypothesis. This lack of knowing is a problem for our guild of brewers, a serious problem. Sure, people out there in the real world know the word. They can uh, perceive the word beer as being the name of something. But they often do not know what that something, this beer thing, actually is. Ryan Heitzkabo, this particular history has been rewritten backwards by over four centuries. A PhD historian recently noted that the actual origin of this word came forth when a member of the Bavarian Parliament coined the term Reinheitsgebot in 1918 during a discussion of the law's application to the new German Weimar Republic. 1918, not 1516. Sam Adams boss Jim Koch re compared the Reinheitsgebot strictures to artistic censorship. But there is actually nothing particularly wrong with the Reinheitsgebot. However, there is something definitely better about knowing the thing, knowing where, why, how it came about, and acknowledging fully what it is actually all about, understanding that something, knowing that something. Innovate comes from the words in and into, and the words new and make new. So innovation is not invention per se, but renewing, restoring, and introducing is new. Matt Ridley recently said, innovation is a direct result of the human habit of exchange. Innovation is the turning of inventions into things of practical, affordable use to people. In other words, perhaps innovation is best perceived as being closer to reinvention, and since the crafting of beers has gone on for more millennia than we can document, it is a good idea to be thinking of the brewing of beers as a process of reinventing and making beers of practical use to people today. In other words, addressing a consumer need in an affordable manner, in a value for money manner. Entertainment value is an integral part of the perceived intrinsic value to consumers of the liquids that we call beer. Knowing the something that beer is, this is an entertainment need today. And I would suggest the consumer does not need to have previously known that they have an actual need for you to provide them with something that virtually instantaneously becomes a need. For example, when the foodstuffs native to the American continents first began to arrive into the old worlds, there was no one in the old worlds that knew that they needed tomatoes and potatoes, capsicum peppers and cashews, cocoa and corn, peanuts and sunflowers, the list goes on. Innovation is not invention, but innovation can be very powerful indeed. It can change the world. Innovation, it is something cool, indeed quite appropriate for all brewers to consider, notably in terms of Matt Ridley's practical and affordable use. Biology, rules for naming and classifying things swing up and down, riding the waves. The classifying roller coaster flips between the powerful attraction of classifying a broad range of organisms within a small number of categories and vice versa. The lumping broad brush approach is attractive to those at the populous center of biology and lumping is indeed a very useful approach. Lumping has a less tunnel vision approach and that simplicity works to invite people in. Splitting things into more groups is also a very useful approach. The deeper you delve into the details, specialists see ever more clearly the distinctiveness in those details. Beer classification naming today. Does it really help people to know beers, to happily associate positively with beers in the everyday when the World Beer Cup now has a healthy part of some 200 beer classes and subclasses? Are these differences too minute for consumers to care about, or are consumers scared away by these multitude of split classes? In contrast, the International Brewing Awards in the UK trace their complex origins back to 1886. These awards have a much more succinct group of beer classes and offer only a small fraction of the awards. Are they too broad brush, lumping beers together that consumers do perceive as different? If consumers do not know the name of something that is barley and beer, how much can they truly know about all of these beer styles? How should the various brewers guilds today consider these questions? The consumer confusion of knowing the name of something while not knowing what that something actually is, this communication confusion continues. 
To invite people into beer, people have to be comfortable with enjoying all aspects of beer. Brewers need to communicate clearly and with positivity the perception of beer. If we do not succeed in this quest, the likelihood I postulate is a continuing decline in the per capita consumptions of beers. We brewers are perhaps better suited to describe ourselves as yeast farmers. Without yeast, healthy, well cared for yeast, there would be no beer. Zero. None. Yet barley has been so much the frequent and the first choice for brewing of beers. Barley is almost as entirely critical a component as yeast. Our consumer need to know these two things. People no longer know what beer is. That is my third hypothesis. That lack of knowing is a problem for our global guild of brewers, a serious problem. Sure, the people still know of the word beer. They recognize it as the name of something, but they do not clearly know what that something is, this beer thing actually is. And barn, the etymology of another word that everyone uses has been lost. Even farmers are unable to make the connection today between barn and barley. This common word barn actually means barley house. Our human history was actually once that closely entwined with barley every day. I'd like to play now, to dissect the word beer letter by letter and to have some fun talking about beer. Beer is about many things, rest and recuperation, relaxation, refreshment, both physical and mental refreshment. Beer is about entertainment, education and edification, and it is about barley. Let's start with R. What's R for? Well, of course, R is for redneck mothers, but R is also for R&R, &R, that's a military slang for rest and recuperation or relaxation, recreation, rehabilitation, all appropriate for beer. Relaxing with the beer. Pour yourself a beer. Take a moment to relax. This may be a short beer break, an acknowledgement that you're taking 15 minutes to relax. Certainly having a beer after working, choosing a beer can clearly be about relaxation. Ours for refreshment a beer provides. Question. You know the word refreshment, but what do you think refreshment means? Especially with regard to choosing a beer. What does refreshment mean to you? Water is physically refreshing. How about beer? At a recent MBAA meeting, a Belgian brewer spoke to what a saison is and is not. Saison must be tart and thirst questioning as it is served to people sweating in the fields working to bring in the grain harvest. Saisons must be low alcohol since you wanted the workers to refresh, rest and recuperate, but also to get back to work renewed. In fact, the refreshments consumers seek from a beer is quite often more of a mental than a physical refreshment. Corona plays this game perfectly. So you hoist a bottle of Corona while Canadian blizzards raising outside and transport yourself mentally to relaxing on a beach. This also means that a Scots strong ale or a Belgian strong ale can be refreshing. Even these strong beer styles may provide the relaxation your consumer mentally needs to refresh. Physical refreshment. What do you think refreshment means? Distilled water is a quick mouth cleanse, but mineral water is a more lasting refreshment. Beer is more isotonic refreshing than water is, and sweeter beer more invigorating than low calorie beer, and higher alcohol gives you a certain physical boost. So what does physical refreshment mean? Those Belgians harvesting the field use their saison beer to provide mental recuperation and some good physical refreshment to reinvigorate them. So R is for refreshment. Consumers best enjoy beers that they perceive provide them with the broader refreshment of mind as well as that of body. Choosing to enjoy a beer, E is uh, certainly about entertainment. It's hard to clearly remember that here in Canada, it was not all that long ago when a tavern would only have a single beer on tap and having a wide choice was two beers. And packaged beer was too expensive in a bar to be, in innovation terms, addressing a consumer need in an affordable manner. Someone from the Soviet bloc of Eastern Europe might still recognize beer as once being closer to a bulk commodity than about entertainment. Beer has been an integral part of human entertainment since beer began to evolve millennia ago. Far back through the mists of time, beers have been perceived as an entertaining part of rituals and a key to communal celebrations. Emerging in 2020, 
people buying 36 and 48 packs of beer to take home and then not being allowed visitors and normal socializing. Well, this is a direct attack upon millennia of camaraderie that beer has always been a part of. As for dancing to the music, the participation and entertainment of dancing has been something else that's been under attack for a great many centuries. Restricting dancing has long been used to control and limit socializing. Bars and restaurants and brew pubs and camaraderie have all been pummeled with rules and rules are definitely not entertaining. Fact is, it's going to be a huge challenge going forward for brewers to find new ways for our beers to entertain our consumers. The synergy of entertainment is crucial to beer. But there's more than one E in beer. E needs to be about education today. Education is essential to ensure that beers can entertain our consumers. I really want to stress this point. Beer is not magically and truly entertaining all by itself. So today, whether a tiny nano brewery or the global monolith ABI, the need is always great to put strong efforts into selling our beers as being entertainment. This 2019 research raises a question. How do we expect consumers to respect and reach for beers if they are daily becoming less aware of what the foundations of beers are? Knowing the name of something needs to revolve back to actually knowing that something. Perceptions matter. Fact is, it is going to be a huge new challenge for brewers to entertain our consumers. To be able to entertain our consumers with a product that these very same consumers are not enlightened, experienced, educated about, then our uphill challenge is quite staggering. Education of brewers, who then make efforts to educate consumers, is needed more than ever today. Fact is, it's been a long uh, been known that mixed messages uh, confuse consumers, and they unfortunately tend to focus memory on any negative implications. Thus, any negative connotations are also likely to be painted out across the entire industry. Consistent, clear, and especially positive messages are required from brewers today. It is clear that increasingly urbanized consumers have lost their historical connections with beer and perhaps caused by losing their connections with the ingredients and the processes that have made beers magic down through the ages. Barley, malt, and yeast. But it's also foolish for us to pretend that less urban people are much different in their loss of connections with barley and with beers today. It is my opinion that every brewer needs to take a leaf from the book of wineries and cider makers. We need to start the story of beer back out in the field where beer actually begins. No more narrow and mechanical images of the brewing process. Much more respect for all the living components that go into crafting of beers. All brewers need to invest their own time and effort to enhance their own awareness from the field and forward. Education is increasingly essential to ensure our beers can effectively entertain consumers each and every day. As brewers, we frequently talk about our yeast cultures. However, I'd also like to encourage brewers to think of all the other aspects of our brewing culture and how we entertain consumers. The fields and our barley and hop plants are certainly part of beer culture. And also our fellow brewers, employees and consumers are the human culture that is beer. B, well, beer is for barley. True story, Kraft Maltster, multi-generational barley farming family, 2020 in Canada. I don't think I've ever eaten barley. Yikes. So let's get going with reconnecting people with barley. Barley was an everyday relationship around the globe for many millennia. This bond with barley has been lost in one half of one short century. If maltsters and brewers are no longer fully connected with barley, this illustrates the size of the challenge that we face. Beer starts with barley. I'll go off on a tangent for a moment. I do love hops and have been able to enjoy being at hop harvest in a number of countries, but over many millennia, people enjoyed beers without the participation of hops. Similar to people enjoying foods for many millennia without the enjoyment of capsicum peppers. Therefore, I will insist upon placing yeast in priority or we would all be drinking Malta beverages and have no beer at all. But I will also insist that barley is next in priority, both due to the consistent historical role barley has played throughout the ages and due to the roughly 100 times ratio the weight of barley involves. Barley is the world's oldest grain. Barley is the world's most globally going grain. Barley evolved alongside humans over millions of years. 
Barley and beer and humans belong together, and barley provides us with food as well as beer. Barley is never focused solely around the brewing of beers. Down through those many long millennia, barley was a crucial part of diet for humans and for our animals. And barley remains one of the most nutritious and the most pleasant to eat grains available. Its recent decline seems to be the barley is perceived as not exotic enough for fickle modern diets. And so we have brewery websites, brewers conferences, brew pubs, and brewers families <clears throat> that offer up recipes and meals with almost anything exotic, but no barley. Please think about this. Take the opportunity to utilize barley in its 101 forms and with the barley recipes of a thousand one cultures from right around the globe. Barley foods is a no-brainer starting point. Barley is grown so widely around the globe, brewers in virtually any part of the world will find that someone close by is growing barley. Reach out and find a barley farm. <clears throat> Chase up local food stores and encourage them to stock barley foods of various types. Get to know barley better. Get to relate to barley every day. So beer, by dissecting the word beer, letter by letter, and having some fun talking about beer can be great stuff. <clears throat> and I hope this is a simple lexicon that can be remembered and acted upon. Knowing beer, this is the opportunity for all brewers of beers, a positive potential that we need to promote. To invite people into beer, we brewers should be working hard and working consistently to make people comfortable with enjoying all aspects of beer. We need to be able to communicate clearly and with positivity. Perceptions matter. Let's be honest once again, the wine industry works closely together, every winemaker doing their part consistently. This includes promulgating positive ways for consumers to feel comfortable with wine. Consumers now clearly perceive that they know what wine actually is. Cider industry also works together. Cider makers all do their part, promulgating positive ways for consumers to feel comfortable with cider. Consumers now clearly perceive that they know what cider actually is. Even if the closest they've ever been to an apple orchard has been rushing past at 110 kilometers per hour on the freeway. Education. It needs to be about each of us brewers helping consumers positively associate with every aspect of beers and brewing. The consumer is immediately envisioning the field, the barley, when they hear the word beer. There are qualified people out there who are willing to speak to the overall benefits of drinking beers in judicious quantities, of course. This is another positive potential for education. Entertainment. We need to bring barley back to the forefront of human awareness and respect. If consumers have a positive affiliation with the key ingredients of beer, barley, it's going to be much more plausible for consumers to freely associate with beer to participate in the enjoyment beer offers. You can perform your own version of research. You can personally investigate how consumers understand barley and malt and beer, even just with your kith and kin and your fellow employees. Knowing the name of something can indeed evolve back towards actually knowing that something. It's become an old statement that people think that milk comes from a supermarket and not from a cow. Consumers have seen and touched grapes and apples and their perceptions are that they know what grapes, wine, apples and cider are but barley has become obscure, invisible, and consumer perception of beer clouded. At one point, every child lived close to the soil and readily appreciated the associations. Fact is that beer has created beer an incredible series of living processes, the barley plant in the field, the malting process, the empirical magic of the mashing process, the flair of hop plants, the soul that the yeast provides to the beer. Beer is alive. Predecessors of grass plants and apes emerged 35 million years ago. Barley and rye diverged 10 million years back just as chimpanzees, gorillas, and human prototypes evolved. Modern humans were populating the planet by 200,000 years ago, and Scientific American relates the research documenting human relationships with grains in Southeast Africa well over 100,000 years ago. Barley became the world's earliest grain crop. 
Barley is the world's most globally grown grain, and humans and barley evolved alongside each other over these millions of years. Barley has been the foundation of beers for many millennia, and the fuel for celebrations and camaraderie and invention and innovation down through the ages. Very clear evidence of barley being dehulled and ground into sophisticated clean flour exists from 23,000 years ago, and barley had already arrived far to the southeast in the highest highlands of Sri Lanka shortly after 20,000 years ago. And soon after, barley was in the north of Japan and growing along the Atlantic coast of West Africa. Barley is the ancient grain. It may not be seen as exotic today, simply because barley does not need to be imported from far afield. We need to promote the positive features of barley and return barley to the level of awareness and respect it deserves. Perceptions matter. Women knew the brewing of beers, and they became some of the earliest entrepreneurs of brewing, as society first began to emerge out of feudal aristocracies. However, it's true that rapid urbanization and population concentration soon created larger brewing businesses. This era of people first moving away from farm-focused communities began the process of people moving away from barley and farms. Women were quite key, key players in Canadian brewing throughout these early centuries, and Sarah was certainly a popular name. These women were very aware of the incredible living processes that constitute the brewing of beers, the barley plant in the field, the malting process, the magic of mashing, the flare of hops, the soul that the yeast imparts into the beer. Just knowing the name of something is simply not enough to support a truly enthusiastic connection. People need confidence in their perceptions to make choices, choices compatriots might not approve of. Beer suffered 50 years of negative connotations and beer's images suffered. Barley strode out around the world with humans. Barley became more widely grown than any other crop. Barley's excellence as the foundation of beers has remained unchallenged down through the ages. Barley needs our respect and our endorsement so that can, we can help people to proudly hold beer and proclaim that they know beer. These perceptions matter, and we need to actively help consumers to once again know beer by knowing barley. The impertinent question is, do you think consumers actually know beer? I hope that we can acknowledge together that for consumers to once again know beer, we need to put out clear, consistent, and positive communications around both barley and beer. I certainly don't want to see uh, the appreciation of beer continue to decline. My hypotheses were that beer needs more people playing together more often. The further we move from our connections between real people and barley, the greater the continuing decline in per capita consumption of beer will be. And people no longer know what beer is. The positive supported barley's success meant that it's not exotic enough, not trendy enough, not imported from far away. It seems we actually do have to reintroduce people to barley today. Please take the opportunity to utilize barley in its 101 forms and within the barley recipes of 1001 cultures from right around the globe. Barley Foods is a no-brainer starting point. Barley's attributes made it the respected grain and the preferred grain for millennia. Since the days of the Mesopotamians and Sumerians in the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East, it spread throughout Asia, everywhere. Barley was taken up across Africa and then Europe and eventually the entire globe. Its nutritional package is superb and its flavor potential is endless. Everyone knew and respected barley up until recent decades. Celebrate barley today. There's a world of ways to celebrate with barley, so I invite you to get more connected with barley and share that passion with those around you. To invite people into beer, we must be working hard and consistently to make people comfortable with all aspects of beer. We need to be able to communicate clearly and with positivity. Beer has always been supported by communication, and today beer is in dire need of us communicating clearly and with confidence so that beer entertains our consumers. Thanks for taking the time to listen to me today, and I'll ask you to make an effort to live these thoughts. Think barley, eat barley, drink barley, educate yourselves and others. Knowing the name of something, I claim this statement helps illustrate an opportunity for all brewers of beers, and I believe that it provides a positive potential that we can all promote. Let's work to invite people back into barley and on into beer. Cheers.
I think I'm back now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. back too. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, that that critical connection that uh, our competitors seem to have maintained, uh, we have not been able to maintain. And I really seriously think that we need to do a better job of getting people back involved. And, uh, you know, it's a, just an everyday thing. It isn't even a hard thing to do. It's, it's a question of you getting yourself uh, involved in barley and every opportunity uh, that you have out there in your home, in your pub, in your uh, brewery, uh, with your friends uh, to reinvigorate that knowledge of barley. It's only going to help sell more beer. That's great. We have a question from Estelle. Um, it says, as a farmhouse brewery, we grow our own barley. And we've been sharing the process of growing, harvesting, malting, and finally brewing. What more can we do to help educate people about barley? Yeah, I think I, I think it isn't that hard. Um, you know, you you are really uh, getting face to face with people. So some, you know, uh, you know, perhaps uh, you have nibbles for sale. You know, when people come in, you know, there's there's ways you can sell barley. You can you know uh, make things out of barley. It's it's that whole awareness. And I think um, you know uh, you're. You, you're growing your own barley. You got a farmhouse brewery. Um, you know, one of the things I've I've done previously when I've had uh, a situation where a lot of with ten thousand people a year were coming through on tours, I made sure we always had seven days. You know, seven days a week it would cycle in fresh barley getting steeped and all the growing stages through so people could visually see it. It's amazing what uh, visually seeing something and touching something is. That really helps them kind of understand the process of malting and appreciate barley. And, uh, you know, just anything you can do with, uh, with barley foods, it's well worth taking on board. That's great. And I think just teaching people how to actually uh, sample barley by tasting it. You know, you look at barley, you can tell the brewers in the room because we pick up a couple of kernels and we and we eat it. So that's great. Uh, Keith, one of the things that I thought was interesting is you, you talked about play and how important it was for learning. So other than this afternoon's quiz show, um, I hope everybody's remembered to sign up. Um, what's, what are your ideas for introducing play back into our industry? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> there's obviously a million ways to, to do that. I think, you know, some sometimes I've I've gone into places where, you know, the staff are far from friendly. Like, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, the, the, they seem to be more friendly in an establishment to people that are regulars and not to uh, new people. So, you know, inviting people in and making it them more comfortable uh, with being in a, an establishment helps them uh, feel relaxed and play. And so the same thing would be true about barley. You know, when you talk about beer and you want to tell people about beer, if they don't have any idea what the ingredients are and you start using words like barley and malt as if they do, it's not working. So, you know, you've got to kind of take that step back to the side and look at what you're doing and see if there isn't a better way to kind of, um, you know, exhibit what barley is, exhibit what malt is, and help people feel relaxed and comfortable. Not just your regular customers who may be a beer geek, but, you know, the, you know, the real people out there, the 99% who aren't beer geeks, because it's only about 1% of people out there anymore, country or city, that really know much about barley. Mm -hmm. We have a comment from Dirk here. Uh, it says, I see ro roasted barley used for tea at the Japanese grocery restaurant I visit. It's not bad. Actually, it's great. I really like it. And maybe that's what, instead of serving coffee at our uh, tasting rooms, uh, we should be, uh, we should, uh, be serving uh, barley tea. We need to wrap up here pretty quickly, but what's your top recommendation for, uh, for us as growers, monsters, brewers, owners, uh, consumers, and industry organizations to build that relationship with beer? Well, uh, you know, we have to treat people individually. I don't, you know, we're not going to have, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of Hollywood to try and introduce quinoa to, uh, to the country. Uh, you know, 
it's about dealing with people individually. And I think, uh, you know, every time there, there's somebody here in Saskatoon that's uh, that at Christmas time was making a, a malted barley uh, chocolate bark and uh, they had, you know, nice, uh, nice malt in that chocolate and, and people were loving it. You know, it, it's a million and one little things that we can do, but it starts by us uh, ourselves. We're going to have a hard time talking to somebody if we're not comfortable with it. So, you know, you got to take barley home and you got to cook with it and play with it and uh, and find your way through through being comfortable as well. And, you know, in this day and age when everybody is supposed to be worried about their health and wellness and their healthfulness and everything else. I mean, barley is also one of the by far healthiest grains in the world. I mean, pearled barley that's pearled right down to kind of nothing still has way more nutrition than brown rice. So like, it's, it's not rocket science. You gotta just jump in and start. Cool, thank you so much, Keith. I thought maybe after that slide about all the service you were going to, uh, Tell us that the, the only thing to do is to get more women back into the industry. So I'll say that doesn't, for you. <laughs> doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your passion for beer and brewing and barley with all of us. Uh, thank you uh, for to BSG Canada and Gambrina Smalting for sponsoring this session. And uh, thank you so much to Mile 37, who has been the theme sponsor uh, of this morning um, to, to bring these uh, speakers to us. We're going to take a break now. We're going to come back at um, 12 o'clock. If I got the right time here, we're going to come back at 12 o'clock uh, where um, the uh, Eric, uh, Eric Wickler from uh, GEA Technologies is going to talk to us about membrane uh, filtration and uh, a new method or a uh, a good method for de-alkalizing, uh, creating de-alkalized uh, beers that taste good. So we'll see you back here at 12 o'clock. <laughs>